Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Paul Balberding. I'm uh, going to be moderating today, and I, I hope that we have a number of people that have uh, participated in this uh, uh, ongoing discussion before. Well, there's no way we can have a single uh, discussion of these topics. Um, and uh, we settled on a little family of, of discussants who really uh, are amazing experts in the field. Um, I'll, I'll just go down uh, my list uh, in order from the top of my screen, Peter Chin Hung, who is a uh, infectious disease, I kind of, these are all infectious disease people, but Peter Chin Hung is at UCSF, um, Carlos Del Rio uh, at Emory, uh, and Bonnie Maldonado at Stanford. And you've seen all of these people uh, all over the place on the various uh, uh, news shows, talk shows. Um, and they really do bring an amazing uh, degree of expertise to this. And I think we're going to have a, a great discussion today. This, this program is um, organized uh, and uh, really sponsored by the International Antiviral Society USA. This is a, an organization that uh, provides um, uh, unbiased, really excellent uh, uh, provider education for uh, those uh, involved in HIV care, but obviously, um, uh, the COVID epidemic uh, knows no boundaries of, of that specialty. And uh, so we welcome people from, from all walks of medicine uh, and all uh, providers that are part of the healthcare team, uh, uh, obviously not just physicians. So um, uh, we've had um, a, a few weeks since our last uh, discussion. Um, the world is different today than it was then. Um, and uh, I think we can we can quickly get into uh, uh, into these discussions. I think that the topic that we want to really uh, address obviously is the uh, is the new variant Omicron. Um, uh, it's not Omicron. It's not Omicron, or maybe it is. Who knows? Uh, but uh, but uh, this is a, a topic of huge importance. I, I have to say it might in retrospect, be less important than it is today, but uh, let's hope so. Uh, and that's one of the things I hope we can uh, we can talk about. You know, we've seen other variants uh, come briefly and, and scare us briefly and then and then kind of fade away. So let's, let's hope that's gonna be true here. Um, but we can't assume that's the case. Um, and so we're all conducting our lives as though it really is something that we need to uh, squarely address. Um, so I'm, I'm certainly hoping we can talk about that. I'm hoping we can talk uh, about the impact of, of vaccines on, on this and, uh, and the Delta variant, but uh, that. Uh, I'm hoping that with Bonnie, who is a pediatric ID person, we can talk uh, a lot about kids. Uh, I think there, there are some questions that already came in from the participants in the program today, um, kind of wanting to be updated on, on the situation in kids, both the uh, conditions that we're seeing and, and the impact on, uh, on vaccines. Um, and I'm also hoping that we can talk a little bit about therapeutics um, beyond vaccines, um, because I think one of the hopes that we might have uh, for a more uh, pan-variant uh, way to control this might be, uh, might be treatments that don't have anything to do with the spike protein. Um, and so I'm hoping we can talk about that as well. So uh, welcome. Let me just have... Uh, each of you uh, give a little bit of background about your own uh, specialty, what your uh, interests are. I've already kind of stolen some of your thunder, but Peter, let's start with you. Um, thanks, Paul. So like Paul said, I'm a professor of medicine, infectious disease specialist at UCSF. Uh, I do, uh, I direct the transplant immunocompromised host service at UCSF, do uh, clinical research focused on diagnostic tests, uh, next generation sequencing particular and um, a larger proportion of medical education recently, um, particularly with um, helping to lead UCSF's efforts in the Central Valley to build a new medical program. So that's kind of the latest. And I've always been very close to the HIV community. It's what inspired me to go into ID and uh, it's very, um, meaningful to me to speak to this audience. Thanks. Uh, super, thanks. And uh, Bonnie, uh Talk to us about you. So I'm a pediatric infectious disease um, epidemiologist. I trained at CDC after my residency and fellowship. And then I've been 
uh, at Stanford my whole career, which, um, you know, I'm so young that it's been very short time since I started, but I am, um, uh, but seriously, I've been here a long time. Uh, and I uh, did a lot of work on uh, PMTCT originally. And also uh, I'm old enough that I started working with the Global Polio Eradication Program at the very early days. So those are my two areas primarily has been PMTCT work and then eradication of infectious diseases, focusing primarily on polio over the years. Most of my work then moved outside of the US once we got a lot of the PMTC US programs in shape, I worked in Sub-Saharan Africa, focusing primarily in Zimbabwe, um, and then um, uh, doing a lot of work on transmission of viruses and looking at real-world effectiveness studies of existing protocols. So before the pandemic, I was actually looking at polio virus transmission in my, among indigenous communities using whole genome sequencing and other me methods to try to understand how viruses move from one person to the next. And so it's been kind of helpful for us now as we're following COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is another small RNA virus. Right, and 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 you know, uh, among the stories that I think we're all kind of watching closely uh, with the new variant is as evidence of transmissibility, um, as well as uh, as the seriousness of the of the clinical condition. So, I'm your expertise is going to something we're going to hope to tap into, Carlos. Um, so, I think actually. Um, if I'm not mistaken, all four of us have spent the bulk of our professional careers in one place. Carlos, uh, you're at Emory. You've been there for essentially your whole career, haven't you? Yeah, pretty much, pretty close to my whole career. You know, I was about eight years in Mexico, uh, which was the time that I was in, in, Mex in, in at Emory. But other than that, I trained at Emory and then I, I was in Mexico for eight years and then came back in 1996. I'm a, currently a professor of medicine, and epidemiology and global health here at Emory. And, you know, like many of us, my, like you and others, my career has been really HIV. And, and those of us in HIV, many of us have sort of shifted to, to COVID and COVID has become what, what we do nowadays. And, you know, this, is, uh, this has been fascinating. And I think it's, it plays a little bit like HIV, but, but in, in very, very high speed. And uh, <laughs> things happen in nanoseconds, right? And, uh, and we'll talk about therapeutics, but I was telling somebody the other day that to me, you know, malnupiravir may be the ACT of, of COVID, right? It's, 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 yeah. it's an interesting drug, it's a useful drug, but we'll get better drugs later, right? Yeah. Exactly, and it, and it looks maybe less well now than it did when it first came out, so a little bit like ACT again. That's exactly right. But yeah. Yeah. And, and then Paxlovid is uh, uh, ritonavir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Well, so, so, just, well, so along those lines, I was mentioning to the group here earlier that we just posted on Med Archives a study that we did here at Stanford on favipiravir, um, which looked great um, in terms of in vitro activity. Um, it's an RDRP. And uh, we did a really pretty nicely controlled- uh, uh, un Unpack, our, unpack the, the acronyms, Bonnie, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, reverse <laughs> RNA dependent reverse uh, RNA polymerase inhibitor. Right, great, great. Um, and so it basically acts against uh, 12 different classes of RNA viruses. And um, a lot of PK pharmacokinetic data was already available, safety data. So we jumped on it as a repurposed drug a year and a half ago, and the data were, uh, did not show any efficacy at all. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it's unfortunate because it was an oral yeah. uh, agent. So it comes back, I don't know what Carlos, Peter, uh, or you, Paul, think about this, but some of these drugs look great in the laboratory. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And then they don't work. So maybe well, it, 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 dosing or maybe something else is going on. I don't know. It goes to the uh, fact that in order to prove something that works in humans, you have to test it in humans. And I think that uh, let, let's let's come back to the therapeutics. because I think I'd, I'd rather start with a little bit, uh, just kind of stepping back and talk about the last few weeks of of epidemiology and what we've been hearing about, uh, we've been inundated. And, and I know Peter's got to leave a little bit early from the program today because he's going yet to another another town hall Zoom. Um, uh, so I'll give him the first crack at uh, at beginning the discussion. Uh, talk to talk to us about where we are and obviously focus on on the new variant. Yeah, so I think where we are right now in terms of therapeutics is really an exclusion in thinking of the pre-hospital world in general. I think no, 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 I, Peter, you misunderstood. I'm not not so much focusing on therapeutics. I'd I'd, I'd like you to kind of start more broadly and talk to us about what we've heard about in terms of 
the outbreak of this new variant and oh, okay. the epidemiology of it. Yeah, we'll get yeah, to the therapeutics. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, sorry. Um, right. So in terms of the outbreak, I think uh, what fueled a remarkable record speed response in the world, stock markets plunging in response was two red flags. The two red flags, the first one was, of course, South Africa was minding its own business, probably 300 cases a day. And then all of a sudden it, it was rapidly uh, accelerating to like 2000 and now it's 9,000 a day. And they're like, hey, what's going on? Where are all the cases happening? Most of them seem to be happening in this one province, Gauteng province where Joburg is. <clears throat> they remarkable speedy uh, sequencing uh, and found out, hey, like 75% of these cases are, if not more, this, this new variant. Um, and I think that was red flag number one. Red flag number two is when they looked at this variant, it, as somebody said, I think, which is one of my favorite quotes, it's the greatest hits of variants. Uh, variant. So it has 50 uh, mutations. 30, 31 or 32 of them are in the spike protein uh, and 10 of them are in the business end of the spike protein, which is like, um, you know, the part that attaches to the receptors so that the virus can enter the body. So that means that if it looks so mutated, the antibodies we developed from the vaccines won't be able to recognize this misshapen spike protein. So potential vaccine evasion. And if the business end of the spike protein is super mutated, maybe it'll be sticky and will hang on to that receptor like a bulldog, wouldn't let go. So it will be uh, more transmissible potentially. So that's kind of where we were red flags. But I think we still have basic questions like, you know, how is it really more transmissible? <clears throat> Does it cause more severe disease? And is it really going to be vaccine invasive? So uh, let, me, let me just jump ahead there. Um, and, and this is open to uh, all, all, all three of you. And I know that Bonnie has a great slide. I don't know if you're going to able, be able to show it today of, of kind of the mutations. But um, A, kind of why the hell does this happen? Why does suddenly a virus um, seemingly out of the blue develop all of these mutations at the same time? Um, I think of mutations as being kind of more sequential and not 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 multiple hits. Uh, what is it about this one? Yeah, and so then, let me. I'll just jump okay, yeah, yeah. Really, go, go ahead. Yeah, you know, I obviously we don't know for sure, but um, I'll see if I can find the picture. I know uh, Carlos had it also on one of his slides, um, but the way this virus mutations appear, it literally just appeared out of nowhere. I mean, if you look at the nexttrain.org website, which I've been, most of us have been following since last March or April when it was set up. Uh, this virus really just, um, the viruses have been slowly evolving over time. This virus just popped up. And so some, uh, there is some speculation that this is uh, a novel variant that just evolved perhaps in an immunocompromised It, it, it's, uh, it's not clear, but that's what it looks like because on top of one another, or at least add on top of one another, and to see one just show up like this that looks so different. Uh, and, I, and I think it's... Um, so, I, so I think, Paul, you know, go ahead, those, of us, those of us, I mean, we know there's viral evolution, and those of us doing HIV, we know how viral is, virus mutates and evolve, and when viruses are being transmitted, you know, respiratory viruses, as they get transmitted, they, they mutate. But in this case, there's two prevailing theories. One is, is what Bonnie's saying, right? The virus remain in an immunocompromised host for a long time. There are a couple of papers suggesting that in people with severe immune suppression are unable to clear the virus, there's enough immune pressure there to produce this evolution. In other words, they're unable to clear the virus, but yet the virus continues to replicate and therefore develops these mutations uh, benefiting the virus. The other possibility is what we call a reverse zoonosis. We know this virus was a zoonosis. It potentially, a human could invest, infect in an animal, and then in the animal, the virus could have evolved and then infected back a human. So, so that reverse zoonosis theory is also a possibility. But, but what we learned here is that I think we need to remember that how we stop virus from mutating is we stop them from replicating, right? We've seen this. We've done it in HIV for a long time. And I think, again, emphasizes that controlling transmission is how you stop viral evolution. Yeah, let's get let's definitely get back to that because one of the one of the um, concerns I've heard raised is that 
maybe this is happening because we haven't been um, uh, great about distributing vaccines to uh, lesser developed uh, areas of the world, and maybe that could help explain uh, why this is going on. So, uh, Bonnie, this is a great slide. Show, uh, show it to us if you could. I, I, it, at least on my screen, it's not kind of fully. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's just a, it's not a slide. It's just a picture that I have from a meeting that I went to. So you can see there at the bottom, um, all of those different lines and colors in gray, black and green. That's the beginning of the pandemic in March of last year or January of, last, of 2019 of 2020. And then this is progressing over time. So these are all of the, the accumulated mutations over time. A lot of these are Delta here at the end. This is time on the right. And number of, and then space across lineages up on the uh, y axis, but you can see this is not that it this red line is the omicron. That doesn't mean that it has been mutating all along. That means it was it's it started off looking like the Wuhan strain, and then this is all brand new. It just popped up right here, and so these are all now new little mini variations in that. So it sounds like it could have done either what Carlos said or could have been a spontaneous mutation on its own. I think that's what concerned people before we knew much about the clinical work is that since it's so new and it has so many mutations, could they perhaps be ev immune evasive? So let me let me jump in, uh, Bonnie. Uh, there are two things. One, uh, the our audience is uh, a lot of a lot of us are HIV interested, um, and one speculation I, I think it's no more than that is that maybe this you know maybe HIV is the fault here. Maybe uh, this came from somebody with HIV and. So I want to talk about that, but when you look at that, Bonnie, that two things strike me. First of all, that you know it's a wildly divergent virus uh, that might make us worried about vaccine control. Obviously, that's one of the things we, we're going to talk about. But another possibility might be that this virus is less uh, capable of causing severe disease. We're still learning about how uh, this virus causes clinical disease. So maybe. Um, Peter or any of you, but but Peter, start with you. Uh, talk about what we know about the clinical disease that this virus is associated with. So the first information we got was from the president of the South African Medical Association, who said that you know it seems that uh, many of these people getting Omicron in South Africa were 18 to 34 years old. Uh, they were university students near Joburg. They were having very mild symptoms, but they were kind of strange symptoms. They weren't like loss of taste and smell to none of that, no shortness of breath. They were like fatigue and headache, maybe some fever and chills, flu-like symptoms, more if you were unvaccinated, less if you were vaccinated. Of course, reinfection was a thing. If you had COVID in the last <clears throat> uh, few weeks, even or months, you didn't seem to be protected. But <clears throat> then we got, uh, and then maybe some high heart rate. Then the European uh, CDC equivalent today, actually in their um, status report, uh, mentioned that of the 70 cases they investigated in Europe so far, <clears throat> half of them were asymptomatic, half of them had very mild symptoms. And of course, in the US so far, it seems that everybody has been at home recovering all the cases with Omicron. So it seems like so far that it's um, not, uh, the sort of big bad Delta, and maybe it's the way that the virus is going to evolve. Maybe it's going to be like the way the 1918 flu pandemic eventually petered out because it became kind of this wimpy virus. But again, the U.S. is not South Africa. <clears throat> we are older. We have more comorbidities in general, HIV notwithstanding, and um, there are more immunocompromised individuals here. We may not have the same amount of exposure to natural infection compared to some communities in South Africa. So that's kind of where we are. So I, I know that this is a, a topic of interest and I see in the chat that uh, uh, one, of the, one of our participants from uh, the General Hospital here uh, has asked the same one, the same moment I did. Um, uh, and, and Guy asked, what about uh, HIV, the rumor that HIV might be somehow linked to this? And I, I don't know. I, I, you know, let me just, Go ahead, I, want, I, I think we should just put that to rest. right? Good, good, good. Go ahead. Put it to rest. Yeah, I, I don't think that's a serious uh, theory at this uh, network, HIV va our vaccine network call 
um, this last Monday was that um, this was actually, as you heard, first arose among a group of people who primarily had already had infected, been infected in the past too. So there was some concern about why there were so many reinfections in this group of young people. So, you know, again, it's hard to know um, whether it's less fit. We know that viruses tend to give up fitness for certain mutations. We certainly know that in a lot of cases, fitness is, um, you know, the less mutated a virus is, the less fit it can be. The original strain may usually be more fit, but, um, but, the, but, it's at, but it also comes at a, maybe it has an a, a, a additional edge that gives it, so for example, more virulence. So we don't know those data yet. The neutralization assays are coming, but I do think that we need to put HIV out of, you know, I, I'm concerned about HIV stigma around this uh, virus. I, I just think that's not a, not a viable um, theory at this point, at least as far as I know. And it doesn't, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter, right? I mean, we, we're not here to add to any, anyone's stigma, it's, uh, none of that, so. But, but you know, but Paul, it, it matters in the sense of two things. Number one, it really matters on the whole issue of the, the priority to immunize patients uh, with HIV and other immunocompromised patients. But it also matters in the sense that if this evolved in somebody with HIV or somebody with that immunosuppression is because they had severe immunosuppression. That means they weren't on treatment, they had low CD4 count, and again, emphasizes that we're not just dealing with a and one they might pandemic. not have been vaccinated either. So world world day stay just happened, and you know there's still millions of people with HIV globally who are not getting antiretroviral therapy, who are not being diagnosed. You know, again, we have a long way to go to really achieve the goals that we, you know, made ourselves do it on 90, 90, 90, and 90, 95, 95, 95. You know, there's a lot of people undiagnosed, there's a lot of people not on therapy. And I think we need to recognize that this really emphasizes the importance of, of public health and the importance of really addressing, you know, immunocompromised patients and not just focusing on one disease. So uh, just to change topics a little bit, let, let me talk a little bit or ask them more about the clinical conditions. Um, we've, I think Peter has said it's not, maybe not the big uh, bad ombre uh, 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 that some have painted it to be, but um, what do we know about the uh, about Omicron variant and severe disease? I know people have asked in the chat about that. Um, uh, do we know any cases yet of, of really severe uh, presentation? I don't think we've heard of any yet. Now, yeah. remember, not everybody is sequencing, okay. but I just think that there's what, Carlos, like 170 isolates and in, uh, in uploaded so far, but we just haven't seen any cases that are severe yet. So yeah, yeah. remember uh, Mu, I, I like to right. liken this back to Mu where we thought it was more severe, but um, I'm in Colombia right now, the country. And Colombia, I was just talking to my colleagues here and they were saying that they are, they're finally at the Delta phase right now, but they were completely dominated by Mu um, and they saw severe cases, a mute Delta came along and wiped it out, whereas And the fact that Bonnie's in Colombia might explain network connections. Oh, <laughs> Bonnie, sorry. No, you, sorry. You, you freeze momentarily, but it's, it's not bad. Um, but yeah, I think that, um, so the, the concern about the clinical condition, anyone else, uh, Carlos or, uh, or Peter, uh, other thoughts about the, the clinical spectrum so far? Well, you know what, I, I've, I've talked to colleagues in South Africa, I've talked to colleagues in, in other places where they're seeing these cases. And I, again, what Peter is saying, but again, we need to be careful, South Africa population is younger. Let's see what happens when we see it in our country. But what appears to be is that people who are fully vaccinated may get infected, but they're not getting severe disease. Again, emphasizing that the vaccines may not protect you against infection, but if they protect you against severe disease or the virus doesn't cause very severe disease, you know, I'll take it. Again, at the end of the day, we have to see where this goes. And it really emphasizes the point that I think right now, most of what we are doing is speculating. We know what the virology is, but the reality is that it's over the next two or three weeks where very good science is gonna come and tell us uh, important things. I, I think there's a, a paper that came out just recently from, from South Africa saying, you know, looking at their data saying, pre prior infection doesn't protect you against this, 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 this strain. And I think that's a very important thing because, you know, we, we have a strong, a big population here who keeps on saying, well, I got natural infection. I don't need to be vaccinated. Well, it looks like quote, quote unquote, natural infection is not sufficient. So, it, I mean, as we're learning things, I think we need to act and we need to respond uh, to that. I think, 
Carlos, you're totally right. I think we can put natural immunity to rest, seriously. I mean, if we haven't already, this is a cold virus. How often do we get infected with these viruses? So it seems to me that the question has always been not what, uh, whether you would get reinfected, but how quickly after mm -hmm. um, exposure. So the question is, will we get to the point where this is a simple cold virus and you you know, get maybe have to be vaccinated for a couple of years or so, yep. and then yep. it evolves into a benign. And issue, it's obviously right? one of the reasons why we don't have any commonly uh, available cold virus vaccines because there are just so many, so many variants. So one of the things that I, that I that I want to talk just a bit, bit about, uh, and and this was a, a topic on the chat uh, uh, line as well here. Um, talk about so one of the thoughts is that perhaps this uh, variant has evolved because of our failure to vaccinate uh, in so much of the world. Um, would this, uh, would vaccinating, uh, you know, all of the world, uh, uh, South Africa, obviously, uh, to the point today, um, have decreased the chance of a variant like this happening? And, and should this give a push for a more equity in our in our vaccine distribution and maybe car maybe uh, peter why well, you know i think that? i think i think there's several carlos, things. <laughs> carlos why I, think, you this? I think we've done i think we've done you know i think we have not done the kind of job that we need to be doing getting vaccine to people around the world i think that there is a still a feeling that we are giving charity right we're giving you what's left over over vaccines and many countries say by the time the vaccines get there, they're about to expire. Yeah. And we're sending them, you know, we send, for example, a big supply of J&J &J to, to South Africa, which said, thank you very much. We send them somewhere else. We don't need them here. We want better vaccines here. Yeah. Uh, we want an mRNA vaccine. Uh, you know, I think there are two issues that really have not been tackled effectively. Number one, we should have been, we're almost a year since this vaccines received their first EUA. We should have had you know, the patent for the production of this vaccine should have been made, made, made open, and we should have had production of these vaccines around the world in, in, in India and many other places. India has vaccinated a, a billion people. We should have ramped up production globally to produce mRNA vaccines to get to everybody. And we should have made a plan to do that. But also the other issue that is, there are two other issues that need to be tackled. Number one, vaccines don't work. Vaccination works, right? In many countries, we leave the vaccines at the airports or the loading docks. We still need yeah. to get them into arms of people, and that logistic needs to be developed. And you know, there's there's and some Carlos, countries. That's the that's the critical issue. I mean, you know, you know, we've all worked on vaccine projects in the developing world, and you can't bring vials in and expect them to magically show up in arms. Yeah, the and there have been, there have been stories about the number of vaccine doses that have gone unused, um, yeah. e even after successful efforts to distribute them. Right? And then the la the last thing I would say, Paul is I was talking to, to friends in South Africa and colleagues, and they said, you know, at least South Africa has plenty of vaccines. Their problem is not lack of vaccines. Their problem right now, quite frankly, is significant vaccine hesitancy. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we need to remember that vaccine hesitancy is a global phenomenon. In so, South Africa. so actually, the, there was another, another uh, a person in the chat. I love how the chat uh, anticipates uh, this discussion because another person was saying kind of, what do we know about the vaccine hesitancy in other parts of the world? And, you know, we get so focused on our own issues and our own politics. Um, you know, South Africa. But, you know, we've heard it. We've heard it in Austria for sure. But yeah. but, so, but you know, South Africa has so I was, uh, just, of, I know, apartheid and racism. I was, bit, 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 bit. Carlos, I was just Carlos, in a Carlos, meeting here in uh, uh, Colombia. We're talking about global health, mostly non-COVID, but vaccine hesitancy for COVID has been remarkably low in Latin America for some reason. Huh? They just haven't seen it. The problem in, in Latin, it's different in every region of the world. So here the problem seems to be, I was talking to my colleagues from Argentina and uh, Panama, they were saying that um, it was access to data, not just the vaccine. So they got some of, I won't say which products, they weren't the ones authorized in the US. There's just no data. They said, we gave vaccines without any efficacy data or safety data. So I think even the physicians and providers were worried. So part of it is rolling out quickly, but having the data to support um, the use. Um, and then in um, other parts of the world, of course, we see, uh, for example, Russian hesitancy because same thing, lack of transparency on data or not, not you know, no data to support. 
So, so I think uh, it, it, those two go hand in hand. Yeah. Transparency I mean, well one population that's kind of been, uh, you know, the sentinel kit, uh, chickens of hasn't seen a population is healthcare workers. I think this, the statistics I've seen in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, is like 25% of healthcare workers want to get vaccinated. So I think that's telling of itself. Um, and in the Caribbean, where I'm from, uh, vaccine hesitancy is, is, is really terrible. I, I think it has to do with conspiracy theories and uh, all of the, the social media uh, things that people are picking up yeah. on. I mean, it's, it's, it's really uh, uh, tremendous. And like Bonnie was saying, I think Eastern Europe is probably where the epicenter of vaccine hesitancy is right now. So let's let's go uh, let's go in a different direction again. I'm being guided by by the chat in part, but um, we we talked very briefly and then kind of jumped ahead. Uh, thanks to me uh, from talking about transmission of Omicron to the clinical condition. But let's go back to the uh, to the uh, <laughs> transmission of it. What do we know about the transmissibility of of, of this virus? I mean, one speculation is that it's wildly faster, that that's why uh, there's so many cases in South Africa. Another thought that I've heard is that maybe there's not as much Delta there to, to uh, compete with. What, what do we know about uh, the competition of, uh, of this new variant? Um, yeah. So Paul, I think the numbers are really small right now to really know what the r not is. Um, but there is a paper that was just posted this morning or yesterday, I think, around uh, something along the lines of uh, uh, Omicron being twice as transmissible as Delta. Um, I, I would be surprised if it were that high because remember Delta was twice as transmissible as, um, as the original Wuhan strain. Right, and right. Um, I, I, I don't know, it's possible, but um, certainly with this degree of mutations, but we just have to wait and see and remember what remember the timeline. We first saw Delta in the US in June. It really took off in July. So it, it took a few weeks and I think we're just gonna have to watch and see, but this also is an opportunity to emphasize that um, we shouldn't be worried that we're gonna step back. What we need to do is remember that we still have preventive measures. So well, those are just gonna need to keep going, masking and distancing and hand hygiene. I'm, exactly. you know, if we don't continue to do that, we're gonna, um, We'll see. We'll get to see the natural experiment. So there was a little joke going on in my family this morning about how you know we're at this phase where stage in this where we we hear these case reports of of isolation of the Omicron. There's two in California. There's five in New York City. It's kind of it's, it's going to uh, we're going to look back on this and say how silly. Um, Carlos, uh, talk to us about transmission. What what are you what are you hearing? You know, what I'm hearing is, I, I, I saw this paper that Bonnie is mentioning with saying twice as transmissible of, of, as Delta. If it's truly twice as transmissible of Delta, as Delta, we're talking about measles transmission, right? We're talking about r knots of, of 15 or so. Yeah, and if that's, that's measles, the case, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And if that's the case, then we're all gonna get infected, right? So we might as well just 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 realize that we're all gonna get infected. So, I mean, I, 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 I honestly, we still don't know. I mean, there's, there's, there's some data suggesting a lot of transmission. Again, there's the case in Hong Kong just got published rapidly in which, you know, the person, one, one person got infected and somebody in the same floor of the hotel, they never had contact with each other, was also infected. It kind of reminded me of the Hotel M outbreak of SARS in, mm -hmm. you know, right, 2003. Right, right. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, we'll learn more about transmissibility. And I think the problem that you're going to have in trying to understand transmission is that you're, you're looking at transmission in the setting of, in many places, in the setting of vaccines and in the setting of NPIs. So it's going to be really hard to understand the true transmissibility of this virus in those populations. Now, if you bring the virus into a population that is unvaccinated, we may see a very different level of disease. You may see a very different level of transmission. And that is something that we need to take into consideration. Again, emphasizing that populations where there's high levels of transmission may not see a lot of community transmission of this variant compared to other populations that there's low level of transmission. Thanks. In one, in one of the, one the studies, in one of the areas in South Africa, about two thirds of the infections occurred in unvaccinated people. But again, you need to know what their underlying immunity yeah. was yeah. before. So I think we need to tease all that let, out. Let me, let me go into that because it, uh, again, it's a question that, that shows up in chat. 
Um, and Peter, I know that uh, your, your clinical practice is focused on people with uh, underlying immunocompromised states, uh, a lot of, lot of from uh, the transplants. Uh, so one of the one of the attendees wants to know more about that. Not so much specifically with with Omicron, but just in general, how, how do we look, look with uh, vaccine and especially boosters for people with underlying uh, both rheumatologic and malignant diseases in terms of their response. So so let's go back a little bit away from the variant and talk about what we know about booster protection. So what we know about um... The, the immunocompromised population in general. First of all, it's a wide range. Even in HIV, of course, you can be immune suppressed very much or you know, have immune restoration with ARTs. You know, it's like that in general population. What we know in general is that about 50% of immunocompromised uh, hosts respond to vaccines uh, by antibody detection. And if you give them one more shot, about 30%, uh, you get an additional 30%. Um, so if you think about that, um, that's kind of getting to, up to general population. So you need a fourth shot, which will be the booster. Um, and if you take the playbook of hepatitis B vaccines and what we do in immunocompromise, sometimes you need like four or five shots to kind of get that antibody detected. So it's no surprise. I think that um, one of the interesting uh, movements is to think about long acting monoclonal antibodies as a bridge to vaccinations so of passive immunity. And AstraZeneca, as people may know, has this 12 to 18 month, uh, you know, potentially uh, a product now that's been submitted for FDA approval that might be that. So maybe like, say, say somebody like Colin Powell, he had multiple myeloma, he had no plasma cells, so you can like vaccinate him up the wazoo. He's, He's not, not going to make antibodies, antibody. right? Yeah. So you'd have well, to probably give him some and, monoclonal and antibody. We, we have a, already an exam, a model for that. We give uh, infants that were born at 29 weeks and younger gestation, we give them palivizumab. Unfortunately, we don't have a lang acting version yet that's been approved by the FDA, but that requires five monthly doses during the winter months, but it's really drastically reduced the rate of death and hospitalization among the under 20 amethyls. Unfortunately, again, it's also very expensive. You know, well, again, and I, I want to emphasize that this kind of, of, of approaches sound good and are good in the US and many other places, in many it's a small number of places, developed yeah. countries, but in the great majority of the world, monoclonals have no role because right. they yes. simply don't exist. And many right. of these well, drugs are not available. That's so where we, the antivirals you really realize that, right? All right, so um, That's moderating true. you guys is, is, is a lot of fun because uh, <laughs> I don't. I, there's no shrinking violence. Car Carlos is putting it in perspective. I like that a lot. So I, I would like. Um, I, I can't believe how fast this time goes, but um, but I'm personally really interested in the in the antivirals. I'm involved in some DSMBs that are looking at that as a Bonnie, if I could say that. Um, so we've now seen uh, some of the results from um, uh, from the from the Merck um, antiviral that looked better at first doesn't look maybe so good today, um, and then we have other ones coming down the line. I think Pfizer is the next one we're going to be hearing uh, more about. So uh, why why don't let me let me again because I know he has to leave early. Ask Peter to start talking about specifically about the therapeutics because um, I think I'm personally kind of would like to see this go the way of HIV. Uh, in the absence of a vaccine, we did quite a bit with therapeutics. So go ahead, Peter, start that discussion. Yeah. So first of all, um, you know we have two currently. Uh, um, you know we have data for two oral uh, pills for COVID. The first, of course, molnupiravir, the Merck product, they said originally it was 50% protected at uh, preventing hospitalization, but then revised the data to 30%. Um, I think it's the first UK has approved it, US has approved it. Um, uh, and, you know, I think it's approved because there's nothing else in the market. And like Carlos was saying, it's kind of like the AZT of drugs. I think it's good. These are going to be the game changers because it's rap. You can like make pills much faster. It seems like than giving away vaccines. Interestingly, Merck and Pfizer already both gave shared pricing to the rest of the world as well as voluntary licensing, which means, hey, generic company, you can make my product. 
I'll give you the know-how, I'll give you the recipe, I'll even provide you uh, skilled labor to make it, and then maybe they'll it'll expire at some point. So, but they're not been doing that with vaccines. The next uh, pill, well, which Peter, is the one reason, one issue, sorry, is okay. uh, we set up when we set up the rotavirus vaccine uh, facility at Barat twenty years ago um, for rotavirus. Um, they'd already been doing bacterial stuff. GMP and GLP is really hard to get through. It's expensive and. For, um, for what do you mean by GLP? I'm oh, sorry, uh, good manufacturing practices and good laboratory practices. So you have to go through a WHO and maybe an FDA uh, set of checklists. So that you can really and, do it. Yeah, and yeah. it's really expensive. And especially if you're going to make a vaccine, whereas if you're making a drug, it may be a lot cheaper. And these drugs are very non-toxic. Remember, these are directed at RNA virus. Uh, sites, so they're not going to be as likely to cause toxic effects. They've been quite uh, effective and safe, at least in in vitro. So, and setting up a, a facility to make a simple pill would probably be a lot cheaper. Yeah. So, I think the companies were smart to make sure they got out the door with those drugs right away, um, because right. It, it is going to make a difference. At least it'll cut back on morbidity. I think. So, Carlos, what do you, what do you uh, what's your take on on therapeutics? Or... Yeah, no, I think I think we need uh, better therapeutics. I think you know the one thing we learned with this virus is number one, the spectrum, the clinical spectrum of the disease is very variable, right? So not everybody's going to need therapeutics, and most young people are probably going to do fine. But you want to use therapeutics to prevent again. All the studies have shown a thirty or fifty percent reduction or whatever in risk of hospitalization and progression to severe disease. So that's what the drugs are doing. You really need you know, these drugs in order to, to prevent progression, severe disease and the hospitalization and death, which is again, trying to mitigate the impact. Now, the challenge is gonna be that you gotta test people quickly and you gotta get them into therapy within yeah. five days. And that is a huge implementation yeah. challenge when you think about you know, how complicated things are and you know, the fact that sometimes you need to wait two or three days just to get a test and then Remember at the beginning of the pandemic, you had to wait seven days to get a PCR result. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think access to rapid diagnostics is going to be really important in order to get people uh, uh, enter into therapy. Now, I do think that if, even if you have a 30% reduction in progression to severe disease, you know, I'll take it. If you, if you had decreased by 30% the number of people yeah. that we had hospitalized during the Delta peak, I think we all would have been very pleased, right? We well, all would have we said, just this approved is really the fantastic. malaria vaccine for about 39% of the same, right, right, same right. reason. And, and then at the end of the day, you know, for the, for the global world, having a pill is gonna be really important. I mean, all of us have seen the kind of things that are being prescribed for the treatment of COVID in, 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 you know, in our country, but primarily in many low and middle income countries, they're giving a lot of antibiotics, they're giving a lot of you know, ivermectin, they're giving a bunch of things that really make absolutely no sense. Well, maybe they're going to have less, you know, less parasites. But at the end of the day, you know, we need a good therapy that we can give to people. And, and I do think that that oral therapies are going to make a difference. The, the, the big question that I'm going to have is, and that I still haven't, I haven't seen data, is do these therapies decrease transmissibility? Because if they do, they become much more effective. Yeah. They really decrease the viral load in the individual and are able to decrease transmissibility. I think they have an additional advantage. So now, one of the we, questions that so many Carlos, of us are asking we could do is, a couple of you know, those studies can, where we can you com can you combine we, these pills? <laughs> where we did look at transmissibility, and I think um, Merck uh, started to do that, and they had an inkling. They haven't presented the data yet, but there was an inkling that the viral load was reduced over time. But again, you need to correlate that with transmission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and I think we, both the, both companies are doing those um, yeah. prep sort of like um, settings and household contacts because it's like what we do in Tamiflu all the time in influenza. So I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do something before our next one of these discussions. I'm gonna develop within our group a, a sign language for, I wanna talk now. <laughs> I love it. You guys um, are jumping in and it's spontaneous and great. Um, and so I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna try to inhibit that at all. But Carlos, you were saying something I think um, a little bit yeah, ago. Common, combination therapy again we come from from the world of hiv right where combination therapy has made a difference maybe maybe combining some of these drugs i mean act would have been thrown away as a single agent but then when it's going to combine with other agents it, it gave us very effective therapy for quite some time so again combination therapy is something that i think needs to be studied in the world of virology typically combination therapy had not been used and it was really hiv that changed that paradigm 
and yeah. started to think about combination therapy. So there may be different approaches that are looked at. I think people have talked about, you know, vaccination applied to the nasal mucosa. I mean, there's a bunch of different strategies, but I do think that that the, the, the key here is how do we have more science? And I'm, I'm really excited that therapeutics is beginning to advance because we really need therapeutics and we really need, uh, uh, you know, better therapies. What we have in therapeutics right now is still very modest. Let, let me just toss in um, an, an obvious point that I think may have, we may have jumped over, which is that the, the therapeutics are not directed at the spike protein. Uh, so there's no reason, as, I, as far as I know, to think that the variants um, should behave differently to the therapeutics. Uh, so that's another really important thing for us for us to watch as well. Um, Bonnie, uh, back to you. So I want to um, I, I do want to kind of give a little bit of an update on where we stand with pediatrics and and COVID. Um, but briefly, if you can, because I want to get back to Peter before sure. he goes. Um, uh, how, how how do things look? Um, what what is the trend in vaccines? When will my uh, 18 month old granddaughter uh, be able to get a vaccine? Yeah, so we just published the New England Journal uh, paper on the five to 11 year old trials for Pfizer. And that was um, the those data were the basis for the approval in the US for five to 11 year olds. So right now in the US about 45% of children um, uh, ages 12 and older are vaccinated now. Um, and then the five year, five and five to eleven year olds were just uh, approved a month ago. They're at about thirteen percent vaccinated, so they're moving reasonably well. Um, we expect that uh, the company Pfizer will produce will submit their data for uh, two to four year olds before the end of the year, possibly for review next year. And then uh, Moderna and J and J are along the lines as well, but we don't know when they'll submit. So. There should be vaccines for kids as young as two. And then the studies are also ongoing for six month olds to 23 month olds. Um, interestingly enough, we were listening to the uh, PAHO people here saying that they currently don't recommend vaccines for kids. And yet pretty much every country in South America who can do it is giving vaccines to kids. Here they're giving it, for example, to three year olds and older. So I think, um, it, part of it has to do, actually, this is important around distribution, is because they don't have access to the vi vaccines that we use in the U.S. So they're worried about the data from the other vaccines. Great. Um, so uh, yeah, Guy Vandenberg uh, asked... If you look at the scope of the development of drugs and treatments, 90% of the drug treatments so far in the pipeline across the world are anti-inflammatory antivirals themselves. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's a, another huge topic. Maybe uh, that would warrant another, um, another one of these sessions is that, you know, this disease looks so weird and that the, the early disease looks like a viral disease, the later disease looks like uh, an inflammatory response disease, the differences in therapeutics, the differences in outcomes and clinical uh, syndromes are, you know, night and day. So, we don't have time today, but I think that might be a good topic for us to think about um, uh, at some point in the future. So Peter, uh, some, some of your thoughts about this before you disappear to the next town hall. So one, one thing I wanted to uh, emphasize is uh, that even though the pills probably won't be, it's uh, probably spike protein independent or alteration spike protein, What's probably going to suffer is the monoclonal antibodies, um, which probably won't, you know, I think be a huge dent, even making the pills even more important. Because, of course, I think we already started talking institutionally at UCSF, like Regeneron won't work, probably for Omicron. Um, the Lilly product will definitely not work. And we'd have to think about, uh, you know, using these monoclonal antibodies uh, uh, very carefully if Omicron really would become dominant. So. Again, another reason to think about the pills. And I like Carlos's idea about combination therapy. I think um, the, the one thing would be drug interactions with Ritonavir and the Pfizer product. But, but I think you know, it is going to be, I think, the wave of the future and more attention to therapeutics. So, so let me just add, ask um, a, a drug that hasn't been mentioned at all so far in the discussion is remdesivir. What, how do we stand? Is that, um, does that have a role? Uh, is it? What do you, what can you say? Um, I mean, I'm sure 
Carlos and Bonnie will have thoughts, but my, you know, Remdesivir was never really embraced by the rest of the world, not embraced by WHO, only kind of a darling of the United States. Uh, doesn't have mortality benefit overall, does have mortality benefit if you need oxygen. So I think it was like teaching an old drug new tricks. Whereas when you see the new generation of antivirals, like the, the Pfizer product, they tweaked uh, a drug, whereas the Merck product kind of took a drug off the shelf. So as you become more targeted and rational in drug development, you're going to get better results. So uh, there's a, a very interesting question that just came up in the chat, um, um, <laughs> this competition of things. Um, is there, a, I'll just read it. Is there a concern that antivirals would allow people to continue to risk being unvaccinated? Uh, do you think there might be a risk? I mean, people, I, I, you know, it's, it might sound crazy well, at first glance, but know, we've heard uh, that people well, don't get vaccinated but are willing to take ivermectin and hydrochloric. Uh, no and they're already, monoclonals are already doing that. People are not, getting vaccinated and it's because they don't want something that is, has emergency use authorization, but they're perfectly happy to take monoclonals that also have an emergency use authorization. So, you know, I think that's already happening. And I think, again, you're gonna see, you know, all sorts of crazy behavior. And I think the issue in vaccines is, it's, it's not an easy one to fix. And we all know that it's gonna be unfortunately something that, you know, there's a, a group of individuals who are not gonna get vaccinated no matter what. And again, I want to emphasize that a lot of that is because of misinformation. And the misinformation through social media now goes everywhere in the world, right? So, you know, misinformation is really impacting people globally. And I frequently now, when I talk to people about vaccines that haven't been vaccinated, is not their lack of information, is their excess of misinformation that is driving their, they not wanting to get a vaccine. And people tend to like getting a pill much more. So, you know, I think that, that I think that, Pills are clearly going to have a role to play. Uh, I wish, you know, if I see a side effect of Omicron, it's hopefully more people are going to get vaccinated. And we need to use this opportunity to really ramp up vaccination. And, you know, uh, I don't want to scare people too much. I want to be cautious about Omicron. But at the same time, I want to not waste right. this opportunity to get more people vaccinated. Yeah, I agree. And, and I, I started the morning with a, with a, a Zoom call um, uh, that involved, among other things, looking at the kind of the maps, the New York Times maps of uh, of the virus in the in this country, and you know, a, a, not that long ago, we saw that you know the the South, um, uh, you know, red hot in terms of cases. That's gone away. Um, the, the at least as of like earlier this week. Um, the, the, the virus has shifted in terms of, uh, of where the risk is to much to the Northeast. Um, so kind of going from the red states to the blue states, if you want to use those terms, um, I, I, I'd like people to guess, <laughs> uh, what do you think we're going to be in, in three weeks? Uh, are we going to see an explosion of cases in the North as people are hunkered down in the, in the cold Midwestern winters? Um, uh, why did it go away in the South? What, where do you well, think things are next? Bonnie, so go ahead. I, start. I just want to say that I can tell you for sure we're going to have flu and RSV. Yeah. So you need to get your flu vaccine. We're seeing a surge in RSV right now. So um, I think that's going to lead to more testing, probably. Um, so we'll probably see more cases. But we're, as you see on the New York Times graphic, um, we're kind of plateaued out. So I do think that that's a little bit of a leftover from Thanksgiving. And um, I don't know what Omicron will do. Remember, we thought Mu was going to take over and it didn't. So right, right. Uh, it could be, you know, as somebody just posted in the chat, maybe this isn't a bad thing. If it's less virulent, maybe it just gives us lots of protective immunity and less disease. So this may be where we want to go with something that's yeah. highly transmissible, but less virulent. And, and, Hard to know. I don't and know another. What Another word that crept in the chat earlier was fitness. You know, with HIV, we used to talk a lot about resistance and fitness. Uh, maybe we should be talking more about fitness uh, with some of these variants. Carlos, um, your thoughts about where the epidemiology is likely to go in the next, let's say, three weeks? Well, you know, I think, I think if I learn anything in the last 18 months is that trying to predict the future is, is not a, a good thing to do in this, in this virus. Because I think Casey Stengel said that, right? Yeah, because the reality is that is that, you know, who could have predicted that, that, you know, in January, we were talking about how India was doing a great job, and then they had a huge surge, and it, everything is, is, is this way, and I think, it, I think it really depends on two things. 
and what the virus does, which means what Omicron is going to do right now, and number two, what humans do. And the more humans we get vaccinated, the more humans are, are taking precautions, the less problems we're going to have. I worry that, you know, again, the holidays are coming, people are having holiday parties, people are going to be getting together with families, people are going to be traveling. And, and I, I, I think that we are going to see an increase, and we're going to see increases in, in certain communities and in certain areas. I'm hoping that we will not go back to the to the to the peak of, of Delta because you know that was really tough on everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I hope that we don't go there. I hope that that people again realize that a pandemic is not over and that we still need to continue taking some precautions. I am excited about you know the possibility of people using more rapid tests. You know, if you're gonna get together with family, make sure everybody's vaccinated that can be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And go ahead and, and test everybody. I mean, there's there's let, ways we can let do. Me, let me interrupt, uh, Carlos. Um, but I know Peter's. I see his eyes looking over at his clock. So, uh, uh, your your last thoughts, uh, Peter, before you have to jump. I'm hoping that uh, Omicron will be a sort of like milder virus, like a cold, and we we will kind of get out of this overall. But I wouldn't want us to forget about Delta. It's still very common in the U.S. It's still causing a lot of hospitalizations and deaths. And like Carlos said, I completely agree. Human factors and virus factors are unpredictable, but there's still going to be a lot of Delta floating around. And to pick up on Bonnie, flu and RSV are going to complicate things. It's estimated that we may see an excess of either 100,000 to 400,000 extra flu hospitalizations uh, just based on the model. So I think it will be a dicey time for hospitals potentially this winter. Great, uh, thanks for thanks for joining us, Peter. If you have to leave, goodbye. Yeah. But uh, Thank you. Uh, and and Bonnie and Carlos, you're still here for another couple of minutes. I I have a question seriously about um, should uh, I um, stock up on on diagnostic tests in my in my home? Uh, if so, uh, which one should I can I use and yeah. how well, should I use them? Yeah, so maybe Carlos has specific brands. I, uh, I don't care about them. brands, yeah. I, yeah, no. So Michael Mina's paper from last year, I still stand by his paper on modeling. And what he showed is that the more frequently you test, whether the test is perfect or not, is actually going to pull more infected people out of circulation. So I've always thought that rapid testing, even though they're not perfect compared to PCR, are going to be a great way to send your kids to school send people back to work. Um, if everybody had a cheap, decent test with you know reasonable sensitivity and specificity, like uh, most of the ones that are uh, could be out there now, I mean, the, it broke my heart to see Abbott throw away all those tests, but um, if we could get them out and cheap, not you know $25 each like they are right now, um, you could uh, get kids back to school much more easily and fam people going to work. So I think those rapid tests need to get out. Biden did say he wanted to Push that. I don't know, Carlos, what you think, but I, I think cheap uh, at home testing to get to work and then people hopefully reporting if they're positive yeah, would yeah. be useful. You know, in, in, in Germany, in Germany, the, uh, the rapid tests are a buck. In, uh, in England, they're free. You know, the plan that Biden announced for the winter said you can get them, but you need to get your insurance to reimburse them, which means that we're not tackling the price. You know, uh, so at the end of the day, I mean, I think that we need to make, in this pandemic, we have failed providing rapid tests to people in this country the way that we should have. And I agree with, with Michael Mina on that paper. I mean, I think we, we need to have more rapid tests available. So, so Jess, uh, Paul, the, my answer to you is any of the available rapid tests, whether it's, you know, Binax Now or Quidel or whichever, you know, get them and, and use them. I think, you know, when you have, congratulations, you just had a, a new a, a grandson or granddaughter, you know, it's a good opportunity. Somebody's going to go visit. That's a good present. I tell people there was a <laughs> there was a board meeting of, of here in Atlanta in which everybody was vaccinated, and I said, you know, now the reception and when you go to the hotel, the people are coming from all over the country, all over the world. When you get to the hotel, there's a little basket with two rapid tests for you to have before you go to the meeting where everybody's going to be on mass. So that's a new welcoming gift. It's a couple of rapid it's, tests. It's like condoms used to be with HIV. Perhaps. Exactly. Now, there's a question in the chat worth addressing saying, how about the 10% travelers in the flights from South Africa to, 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 to the Netherlands that were infected? Uh, well, it turns out, the, I, I've looked into that carefully. It turns out the Europeans were not testing. They had actually stopped testing, requiring testing before the flights. 
they were actually relying only on vaccine passports. And I think it's a good example that vaccine passports are not sufficient. And I, I am really happy with the US continue to require you know, testing prior to international flights, regardless of whether you're vaccinated or not. Because at the end of the day, it helps to have testing done before flights. But the reality is that you know, now you know, the, new, the, new, uh, uh, you know, sort of the new plan from the White House is to move that from 72 hours to 24 hours. And that's based on that modeling, suggesting that the sooner before the flight you get tested, the better it is. I also recommend that when you, know, when you return from an international flight, I do it in domestic flights, two to three days after the flight, I also get tested, right? I think it's really important to realize because when you travel, it's not the plane, it's the other things that you do. You know, you yeah, travel yeah. somewhere and you're more likely to go to a restaurant, to be with other people. So you're getting exposed and we need to all realize that you may not realize it, but you may be exposed. And you, what you want to do with a test is to prevent you from infecting others after you've been right. diagnosed. So we're really at the end of our time. I just want to uh, mention that Catherine Hankins, uh, who is one of my heroes, heroines, uh, in the HIV world is with us today. That's great. Um, and a number of other people too. Uh, we've had a great uh, discussion um, and uh, I've really come away from these energized and, uh, and it's just fun uh, interacting with the three of you. Um, and I hope we can do this again. So uh, really thanks to everyone. Thanks uh, uh, for the International Antiviral Society USA for, for putting this together and hosting it. There's another program coming up where uh, George Rutherford will be talking, another, another hero in this epidemic. So uh, uh, really uh, great. And thanks to the, to the audience. You've been fantastic. We had over 300 people uh, earlier on. So uh, it's, it's super. So uh, goodbye. We'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Paul. And Thank thanks you, for Paul. everybody. Take yep. care. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.